Hi, and welcome to the lecture on stress and vocal mechanisms. I'm gonna apologize in advance. My voice is pretty bad, I'm pretty sick, uh, but hopefully uh, we can still make this useful so that you can get the key points out of uh, the lecture material I have. So we're gonna do three things. I'm gonna cover three things in this lecture. The first is an introduction to rock mechanics. The next is the double couple model for earthquakes. And the third is looking at basic patterns of faulting and focal mechanisms, also called fault plane solutions. Next time, I'll talk a little bit more about faulting associated with the wet out of off zone. So starting with an introduction to rock mechanics, this rock mechanics is really just the behavior of rocks in response to forces. So a very simple principle with rocks is that stress on those rocks causes strain. Stress is defined as force per unit area. So force is something we talk a lot about in physics. And stress is just looking at that force per unit area. So there are two main kinds of stress. Normal stress, which is perpendicular to a surface, and shear stress, which is more parallel to the surface. And so again, you can really just think of those as the forces. If the force is pushing right down onto a surface, that's a normal stress. And if there's a force that's pointing right along the surface, that's a shear stress. All right, and then strain is defined as material deformation due to stress. So there's some kind of change in that material. So there's a couple different types of deformation. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. The first is elastic. This is where strain is not permanent. That when the stress is removed, the strain uh, re the object returns to its original uh, configuration. The next is ductile. You can often hear referred to as plastic deformation. This is where some strain is permanent. So there can be a combination of elastic and ductile. And then last is brittle, where the failure due to the stress exceeds the strength of the material. The rock is just not able to withstand the stress anymore and it breaks. Okay, so I've got three examples that correspond to these three types. And so I want you to think about what happens when they're stretched. The first is a rubber band. The next is chewing gum. And the third is a piece of paper. And so I'm hoping that you'll see that these three correspond well to the elastic, uh, the ductile, and the brittle. Right? But what's important here is it's not just thinking about, you know, rubber band, you stretch it, it goes back to its original shape. Chewing gum, if you stretch it, it doesn't go completely back to its original shape. In paper, if you pull it, it tears. The reason I bring this up is because for rocks, they can actually experience all three kinds of this deformation depending on the amount of stress and strain. The usually what will occur is that during low amounts of stress and strain, you get elastic deformation. So if the stress is removed, the strain returns back to zero. But at some point, if the stress goes over the elastic limit, you then get a period of plastic deformation. Now again, if the stress is released, this time now the plastic deformation is not going to go back to its original point. So you'll, you'll just see the line go back down like this. So there's some elastic deformation there that's lost. But the plastic deformation is preserved, right? At zero stress, there's still a significant amount of strain. That's the ductile strain. But at some point, if the material is stressed enough, it'll go past elastic and plastic and it'll fracture. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, measurements that are made in a lab using a uniaxial compression device. And so this is an instrument here that has two large pieces of metal on the top and bottom that are uh, like big round objects that are in essence a lot like a trash compactor, right? That they push down as a machine to try and uh, compress this material in between them. So think of this as a cylinder of rock in here. So again, you can't see the three dimensions here, but think of this as a cylinder. Think of these guys as much wider cylinders made of metal instead of rock. And we're just, the reason this is called a uniaxial is we're just compressing it in this direction, either this direction or in and out of the screen. Um, we're not compressing it. 
Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the material before the failure happens when it's under this uniaxial compression. Okay, so the maximum compression stress is oriented vertically. And the sigma 1 also causes, uh, is also called the p-axis. Okay, and then the maximum extensional stress is always oriented horizontally, 90 degrees away from the maximum compression stress. This um, is our sigma 3. It's also called the t-axis in seismology. All right, the question then is what will be the orientation of failure? What will happen when this rock gets stressed too much that it actually breaks? So let's look at that. After failure, the fault planes will be oriented between about 30 and 50 degrees, and so we normally use 45 degrees as our estimate for the orientation of the failure plane. And again, in that case, it'll be 45 degrees from both the p-axis and the t-axis, right? If it's 90 between here and here, we got 45 on either side. All right, and then our auxiliary plane, the one perpendicular to the fault plane, is also 90 degrees away from that, and it'll be 45 from both the p and the t-axis. All right, so let's look at how stress has changed in that rock sample. Well, there's a four stress quadrants that are induced by the failure motion. The first two I'm going to highlight are these areas here, where these are areas that have now been more compressed based on this deformation, right? Things are sliding here and sliding here based on this compression. And that means the rock material here is getting compressed. Rock material here is getting compressed. These white areas here are areas where the material is moving away, and that's leaving some dilational quadrants here. Now this relates to how we think about earthquakes. They follow a similar double couple to what we just saw there. So in an elastic body, the fault slip from an earthquake causes this forward quadrant pattern of compression waves that we can actually observe. The compressional quadrants result in upward motions on our seismometers, and the dilational quadrants result in down motions on our seismometers. So we can use this information to figure out what kind of motion took place on a fault. Again, in this case, we've got a strike sub fault moving on this side to the north, on this side to the south. That leads to northwest quadrant being compressional, southeast being compressional, northeast dilational, southwest dilational. So again, we can then look at seismic recordings and use the first motions, the first direction that the seismogram moves when the earthquake waves arrive. So this is an example of collected first motion measurements from an earthquake. We've got three over here, three over here that show upward motions, three over here, three over here that show downward motions, and the earthquake here in the center. And so again, this is distance being plotted out away from this earthquake. Also, you can think of it as sort of angle that the path takes through the Earth. That could, how it goes back to an earlier lecture, but you can just use distance for now as an approximation. You then use the uh, upward and downward motions to find compression, the shaded quadrants here, and dilational white quadrants here. Right, and so that means there are then two what we call nodal planes, where you go from one kind of motion to the other. Now, you still need additional information to tell which one of these is the true fault plane. You could have fault slip that looks like this. Again, see the arrows are pointing into the up. Arrows are pointing into the up here, too. So either one of these could be the true fault plane if you just have up and down motions. You can't tell. But a lot of times you get aftershocks that help outline the fault, and you also have some kind of geologic evidence of the fault. Both those are used to make informed decisions about which one of the of the two nodal planes is the correct fault plane. All right, so the next thing we want to do is determine the original stresses. So before failure, the axes of maximum compression stress, the p-axis, the axis of maximum extension stress, were oriented 45 degrees from the fault plane. The 
x-axis here bisects the resulting dilatoral quadrant, whereas the t-axis bisects the resulting compressional quadrant. So again, remember that one of these is our fault plane, but these now are aspects of what the stress was like before the faulting took place. So again, we've taken motions that we've observed after the earthquake took place, and we're using them to figure out what were the stresses that led to that earthquake. Again, as you can see, this would be a really helpful strategy to use seismology for, to take new earthquakes and use it to tell us about what the stresses were that led up to those earthquakes. So the history of focal mechanisms that they were a great success after the worldwide standard seismographic network was installed in about 1963. Just gave us enough information of ups and down motions over all over the world to be able to characterize the focal mechanisms of relatively large earthquakes, five or six and above. So there's a published a paper published by Lynn Sykes in 1965 that showed the slip of an earthquake between mid-ocean ridges. So you've got a mid-ocean ridge here, mid-ocean ridge here, and what we know is the transform fault today. At this point, early on in plate tectonic theory, there was still a debate about whether or not these were features that were offset by a fault that was moving this side to the right, or what a transform fault truly is, material on this side moving to the right, material on this side moving to the left. Again, those would produce exact opposite strengths of faults. Right? So whether the fault is moving this way, in this way, or this way, in this way, is something that we can figure out with focal mechanisms. And again, it's the, the notion here that Lynn was trying to push for was that there was motion opposite of the apparent offset between the ridges. And this would be proof for Wilson's transform fault. In many respects, people refer to this as the birth of seismotectonics, seismology being used to establish aspects of plate tectonics. Now in modern practice today, we don't just use those first ups and downs to determine a focal mechanism. We do more detailed inversions and modeling, forward modeling of full waveforms to try and get a full and better feel for what those focal mechanisms are, even when we only have a handful of measurements. The results from the last maybe 40 years or so of applying this technology has been really impressed some patterns of consistency among nearby earthquakes. If you wanted to explore this a little bit more, I recommend going to the USGS earthquake site there and looking at some of their fault plane solutions to demonstrate focal mechanisms on a wide variety of faults. If you choose a recent earthquake, you can look at oftentimes historical moment tensors in the, in the area. But prop, probably the best database to look at is the CMT. Um, database. It's moved recently from Harvard. It's now the global CMT search engine, but you can still find a link from there. And the search engine is for fault plane solutions that have been determined for earthquakes all over the world for the last 40 plus years. Okay, so I want to end this lecture by focusing on a couple of basic patterns of faulting and fault plane solutions and looking at those focal mechanisms and how they relate to those faulting patterns. All right, the first I'm going to start with is a pure strike slip faulting vertical dip fault. Okay, so on map view, it looks a lot like this. Basically, two nodal planes here and here, and they're both perpendicular to one another. And then we've got four alternating quadrants of compression and dilation. First motion up, first motion down. These are examples you've seen up to this point in the lecture. The P axis here, the axis of maximum compression, that bisects the white quadrant, the t-axis, maximum extension. That bisects the shaded quadrant. Cross-sectional view, if I take a cross-section right here, north to south, it shows us a pattern that looks like this. There's only two quadrants visible now, and it has sort of a beach ball pattern to it. Again, this comes from the nature of the curved lines here. Okay, but again, if we're taking a cross-section here, you can think of it as that we're looking at the sort of back hemisphere of that going from north to south, right? So we're seeing some white over here. We're seeing some black over here. We're seeing some white over here. 
Okay, so this is what a straight slope fault looks like in cross-sectional view. All right, the next is a reverse fault. This is what it looks like in math view. Again, it's the beach ball. We've got two nodal planes, but they're curved. And there's three quadrants that dominate. The center portion of the ball is shaded, surrounded by two white quadrants. Oh, I should just mention here that this means the p-axis here is oriented uh, sort of uh, from uh, east to west here, or west to east. Cross-sectional view, there's a four-quadrant pattern, and it looks like the map view image of a strike slip fault. So again, it's really important to recognize if you're looking at a map view or a cross-section view of, of a beach ball or a focal mechanism. In most cases, you'll see map views, but it isn't uncommon to see cross-sectional views I just want to make sure people connect when you're looking at a cross-sectional view that this one of these fault planes here can support corresponds to something like this in terms of rock as layers being offset right this guy here corresponds to this one here things are moving up here things are moving down there again we've got the shaded quadrants on top and bottom and you can think of it here that our map view is looking at the bottom part of this cross-sectional view again the thing we're plotting is the stress quadrants in three dimensions. It's a three-dimensional sphere, if you will, and we're just taking slices through it, looking at the back hemisphere. Okay, last is the normal or extensional fault. This is just the opposite of the reverse, so instead of black here in the middle, it's got white, and it's got these shading on the two sides. That's our map view. And again, in this case, you've got extension coming out Sorry, the T-axis axis of maximum extension coming out east-west. And of course, that's why there's it's a normal fall. Again, the cross-sectional view has the four quadrants, with this time the white on the top and bottom. It's got our P-axis pushing in and our T-axis pulling out. And again, it corresponds to a fall like this. Motion's going down and up. All right, last case is for oblique faulting. Or we just get a mixture of strike slip and dips of vaulting. So instead of, in this case, having a simple pattern of white, red, and white, you can see the little plane is tipped here a little bit. And that means you just got a combination of strike slip, a little bit of strike slip that brings this from the edge out here, but it's primarily a reverse fault. In this case, primarily a normal fault, dark on the sides, light in the middle. But again, it's got a little bit of strike slope motion to it, which brings this in from the side. So this is oblique reverse faulting. This would be oblique normal faulting. Okay, that's the lecture on focal mechanism. I hope that helps to better understand it. I hope my voice wasn't too bad. All right, thanks.